Question. The accumulated no then accumulated knowledge is not wisdom. Answer. Good heavens, no. If knowledge were wisdom, the achievements of science would not have been converted into implements of destruction. What is needed to convert knowledge into wisdom? Time plus the desire for wisdom. Wisdom is never thrust upon one. It is acquired, if at all, by positive thinking, through voluntary effort. Is it safe for all people to have knowledge? It is never safe for anyone to have extensive knowledge without wisdom. What is the age at which most people who acquire wisdom begin to acquire it? The majority of people who acquire wisdom do so after they have passed the age of 40. Prior to that time, the majority of people are too busy getting, gathering knowledge and organizing it into plans to spend any effort seeking wisdom. What circumstance of life is most apt to lead one to acquire wisdom? Adversity and failure. These are nature's universal languages through which she imparts wisdom to those who are ready to receive it. Do adversity and failure always bring wisdom? No, only to those who are ready for wisdom and have voluntarily sought it. What determines one's readiness to receive wisdom? Time and the nature of one's thought habits. Is newly acquired knowledge the same as time-tested knowledge? No knowledge, tested through the lapse of time, always is superior to that which has been newly acquired. Time gives to knowledge definiteness, in both quality and quantity, and dependability. One never can be sure of knowledge that has not been tested. What is dependable knowledge? It is knowledge which harmonizes natural law, which means that it is based upon positive thought. Does time modify or alter the values of knowledge? Yes, time modifies and alters all values. That which is accurate knowledge today may become null and void tomorrow because of time's rearrangement of facts and values. Time modifies all human relationships for better or for worse, <laughs> depending upon the policy through which people relate themselves to one another. In the realm of thought, there is a time when it is proper to sow the seeds of thought, and there is a proper time to reap the harvest of those thoughts. The same as there is a time to sow and a time to reap from the soil of the earth. Without proper measurement of time between sowing and reaping, nature modifies and withholds the rewards of the sowing. Go ahead now and describe the last two of the seven principles. The next principle is harmony. Throughout nature, one may find evidence that all natural law moves in an orderly manner through the law of harmony through the operation of this law nature forces everything within the range of a given environment to become harmoniously related understand this truth and you will catch a new and more intriguing vision of the power of environment you will understand why association with negative minds is fatal to those seeking self-determination. Do you mean that nature voluntarily forces human beings to harmonize with the influences of their environment? Yes, that is true. The law of hypnotic rhythm forces upon every living thing the dominating influences of the environment in which it exists. If nature forces human beings to take on the nature of the environment in which they live, what means of escape are available to people who find themselves in an environment of poverty and failure but desire to escape. They must change their environment or remain poverty-stricken. Nature permits no one to escape the influences of his environment. However, nature, in her abundance of wisdom, has given to every normal human being the privilege of establishing his own mental 
spiritual, and physical environment. But once he establishes it, he must become a part of it. This is the inexorable working of the law of harmony. In a business association, for example, who establishes the dominating influence that determines the rhythm of the environment, the individual or individuals who think and act with definiteness of purpose, is at its is it as simple as that? Yes, definiteness of purpose is the starting point from which an individual may establish his own environment. I do not seem to follow your reasoning. The entire world is torn with warfare and business depressions and other forms of strife which represent about everything except harmony. Nature does not seem to be forcing people to harmonize with another. How do you explain this inconsistency? There is no inconsistency. The dominating forces, the dominating influences of the world are, as you say, negative. Very well. Nature is forcing human beings to harmonize with the dominating influences of the world environment. Oh, I have one problem. Manifestations of harmony may be either positive or negative. For example, a group of men in prison may, and they, generally do think and act in a negative manner. But nature sees to it that the dominating influence of the prison is impressed upon every individual in it. A group of poverty stricken people in a tenement house may fight among themselves and apparently resist all forms of harmony, but nature forces each of them to become a part of the dominating influence of the house in which they live. Harmony, in the sense it is used, means that nature relates everything throughout the universes to every other thing of a similar nature. Negative influences are forced to be into association with one another. No matter where they may be, positive influences are just as definitely forced into association with one another. I am beginning to see why successful business leaders are so careful in the choice of their business associates. Men who succeed in any calling establish their own environment by surrounding themselves with people who think and act in terms of success. Is that the idea? That's the idea exactly. Observe, with profit, that the one thing all successful men insist upon is harmony among their business associates. Another trait of successful people is that they move with definiteness of purpose and insist upon their associates doing the same. Understand these two truths, and you understand the major difference between a Henry Ford and a day laborer. Now tell me about the last of the seven principles. The last principle is caution. Next to the habit of drifting. The most dangerous human trait is a lack of caution. People drift into all sorts of hazardous circumstances because they do not exercise caution by planning the moves they make. The drifter always moves without exercising caution. He acts first and thinks later, if at all. He does not choose his friends. He drifts along and allows people to attach themselves to him on their own terms. He does not choose to uh, an occupation. He drifts through school and is glad to get the first job that will give him food and clothing. He invites people to cheat him at trade by neglecting to inform himself of the rules of trade. He invites illness by neglecting to inform himself of the rules of sound health. He invites poverty by neglecting to protect himself against the environmental influences of the poverty stricken. He invites failure at every step he takes by neglecting to exercise the caution to observe what causes people to fail. He invites fear in all its forms by his lack of caution. In examining the causes of fear, he fails in marriage because he neglects to use caution in his choice of a mate, and he uses still less caution in his method of relating himself to her after marriage. He loses his friends or converts them into enemies by his lack of caution in relating himself to them on a proper basis.
basis. Are all people lacking in caution? No. Only those who have acquired the habit of drifting. The non-drifter always uses caution. He carefully thinks his plans through before he begins them. He makes allowances for the human frailties of his associates and plans ahead to bridge them. If he sends a messenger on an important mission, he sends someone else to make sure the messenger does not neglect his mission. Then he checks on both of them to be sure he wishes his wishes have been fulfilled. He takes nothing for granted where caution provides a way to ensure his success. Isn't over-caution as detrimental as lack of caution? There is no such thing as over-caution. What you call over-caution is an expression of fear. Fear and caution are two entirely different things. Don't people mistake fear for over-caution? Yes, that does sometimes happen. But the majority of people create for themselves far more disastrous hazards by total lack of the habit of caution than by over-caution. In what way may caution be used most advantageously? In the selection of one's associates and in the one method of relating oneself to associates. The reason for this is obvious. One's associates constitute the most important part of one's environment. The environmental influences determine whether one forms the habit of drifting or becomes a non-drifter. The person who exercises due caution in the choice of associates never allows himself to be closely associated with any person who does not bring to him, through the association of some definite mental, spiritual, and economic benefit, isn't the method of choosing associates selfish? It is sensible and leads to self-determination. Huh. It is the desire of every normal person to find material success and happiness. Nothing contributes more to one's success and happiness than carefully chosen associates. Caution in the selection of associates becomes, therefore, the duty of every person who wishes to become happy and successful. The drifter allows his closest associates to attach themselves to him on their own terms. The non-drifter carefully selects his associates and allows no one to become closely associated with him unless that person contributes some form of helpful influence or bestows some definite benefit. It never occurred to me that caution in the selection of friends had so definite a bearing on one's success or failure. Do all successful people exercise caution in the selection of their, all their associates, whether in business, social, or professional relationships? Without the exercise of caution in the choice of all associates, no one may be certain of success in any calling. On the other hand, lack of exercise of caution brings almost certain defeat in whatever one undertakes. Summary. Three things connected with my interview with the devil interest me most. These three factors interest me because they have been the most important influences on my life, a fact which any reader of my story can easily discern. The three important factors are the habit of drifting, the law of hypnotic rhythm, through which all habits are made permanent, and the element of time. Here is the trio of forces which hold inviolate the destinies of all men. The three take on a new and more important meaning when they are grouped and studied as a combined force. It takes but little imagination and scarcely any understanding of natural laws for one to see that most of the difficulties in which people find themselves are of their own making. Moreover, difficulties seldom are the outgrowth of immediate circumstances. They are generally the climax of a series of circumstances which have been consolidated through the habit of drifting 
and with the aid of time.